So uh, with my lightning talk, I kind of want to follow kind of a series. So when I look at some code other people wrote, sometimes I think, I think they're doing it wrong. So I want to capture those moments and follow them into lightning talk and just kind of have a series of you're doing it wrong. Uh, and I'm going to start with async and await because <clears throat> I see a lot of incorrect async and await code. And I've even downloaded some sample code from Microsoft pretty recently that had some bad async and await in it. So I think it's something we could probably brush up on a little bit. So let's get started. So a little bit of background. <clears throat> We've had a few different patterns in the past to try and solve the asynchronous issues. Uh, the first we started with was called the asynchronous program model, heretofore known as APM. And you'll remember that with the awesome begin, read, end read, and I async result stuff, and <clears throat> that kind of thing it was kind of kludgy, kind of clunky, difficult to follow, messy. Uh, later, that was uh, succeeded by uh, the event-based asynchronous program programming pattern, EAP. And that was a bit of an improvement, especially considering we had lambdas that would allow us to put at least the code, the asynchronous part of the code inside the same method. But it's still pretty messy. Um, it can be difficult to debug, it can be diff difficult to follow, those kinds of things. <coughs> and then later on uh, with C-sharp 4 and then later C-sharp 4.5, we get TAP, uh, which is the task-based asynchronous programming. When we got done at 4, we still have async and await, but we did have TAP because t the heart of that is simply uh, returning a task and then allowing us to use the task parallel library or the TPL at some point to wait for the task or uh, continue on after it's done, etc. cetera. Uh, so what was wrong with some of the previous attempts is one, like I mentioned, they were really difficult to debug, created kind of some spaghetti code. We had part of our logic over in one method, then part of it in another method. Uh, and uh, even if it was all in the same method as in the EAP, <coughs> It would jump around between the different lines in your method. It gets really difficult to follow. <clears throat> Another uh, big problem we had with those is how the exceptions had worked. In uh, the APM, the exception simply came in as an object on your async result. And if you weren't vigilant at checking to see if you had that exception, you would miss them completely. Uh, also, neither one of those had any way to cancel uh, an asynchronous call while it was being, after it's been dispatched. So we're in a pretty good place now with uh, the .NET 4.5 Plus where we can do the async and await. Async and await is really awesome, but it's a little bit misunderstood, and so I'm hoping to shed a little bit of light on it. It's really an easy thing, but sometimes there's difficulties with them. So <clears throat> next thing I want to talk about real quick is why is asynchronous programming important? And uh, the revelation basically here is that when we have a, an application, particularly a Windows form or WPF type application, or even a mobile app, <coughs> the drawing, the, the controls that are on our object, on our, our form, are not actually ours. We don't really own those. Those are drawn by the system. They're drawn by WinForms or by WPF. And the thread that they're running on is the only thread that has access to those things. So graciously, they are allowing us to run some of our code on their thread. That's kind of how you have to think of it. Uh, and the way it kind of works is <coughs> uh, underneath every Win application, there's a WinProc that kind of pumps a message queue. Everything that we do to interact with our uh, form from the operating system comes in through this message queue, whether it's a mouse move, a mouse click, a button press, everything goes through these WinProc. <clears throat> so if we run our code on that GUI thread and we're not very considerate and we take a bunch of its time, we're going to miss things or delay things like button clicks or mouse moves or mouse clicks. <clears throat> and that just provides a really terrible user experience because nobody likes the frozen app where it just kind of grays out and you can't do anything with it and you just want to throw it in the trash. So <clears throat> kind of with that perspective, it's really important we get it right. On web applications, it's a little bit more nuanced, but <clears throat> essentially the idea is 
when a request comes into a web server, it's going to be dispatched onto a thread pool, a pool of threads, not the thread pool, a pool of threads. That pool can only be a certain size. Once all those threads are busy, it simply just queues those up and you don't get to execute that request at all until one of the other threads gets free and you can execute it. It's been one of the biggest obstacles or stumbling blocks to uh, server scalability is the fact that when we have something executing, if it's I.O. bound, that thread's going to sit there idle, but nothing else can run either. So <clears throat> this is actually a really big help with the uh, TPL on IIS, modern IIS. <clears throat> the number of concurrent users uh, increased dramatically, vastly, drastically from something like, you know, a typical web application holding maybe, maybe 100,000 concurrent users <coughs> to something more like a million concurrent users. So drastically improves your uh, scalability for these web servers. <coughs> Works a little bit differently though, and we'll talk about some more of this, but your request <coughs> on uh, ASP.NET might be completed on a different, different thread than it started from. So we'll look at that a little bit. <coughs> Okay, so before we can get a little bit of understanding, we need a little bit more vocabulary. So what I want to talk about just for half a second is something called synchronization context. There is a synchronization context for everything that uses await. It's essentially what await plugs into to make the magic happen. Uh, for Windows Forms, there's something called the Windows Forms synchronization context. And under the hood, it's going to take these await calls and it's going to use uh, control.begin invoke to be able to execute these on the GUI. <coughs> Same thing with WPF, except for it's dispatcher. And the ASP.NET one works a little bit differently in that it's just making sure that it's only running that result once and a free thread type thing. Uh, and, and it happens in kind of two steps. So, <clears throat> and we'll, like I said, we're gonna get this a little bit more nitty gritty, but there's always two steps to this process. One is that you're capturing the current synchronization context before you're, you're awaiting. And then upon its completion, we're going to kind of resume you where you were before. Now, that's usually true. There is a way to kind of tell it not to. You can actually skip the entire second step with this uh, task.configure await and then continue on capture context faults. Instead of continuing where you were before on the thread you were before, it'll essentially just let you finish out on the thread that completed. So it gets a little bit of a performance boost. Sometimes you don't actually need to finish on the GUI thread. So a little bit of a pro tip there. Okay, so as described, we have this message pump and we're gonna have this sample code. So we're assuming this is kind of like a wind forms type of code. And you'll see you have async void button one click. That's going to be invoked actually by our message pump. Remember when you click or interact anywhere on a Windows forms, WPF, etc., it's not actually invoking your thing directly. It's putting a message on the when proc message pump that something got clicked here. When this message pump runs, as it did there, it's going to see that click, and we're going to start our execution, <coughs> line one of button one click. Well, it's going to be calling the load settings async, which is an async await. So we're gonna move on over into here. And here, the only thing I have here to do is also asynchronous. So we're pretty much done with this method for now because we're returning the await. Now returning the await, as, a, as I call it, is kind of similar to the yield return, if you're familiar with that with IE numerals. We're just kind of returning temporarily for now, kind of, sort of, right? So what that's really gonna do, though, is it's going to create this await object. And that await object is going to be put onto that message pump. Then we're going to return right back where we, we were, and this is also an await object, so it's going to do the same thing. We're returning the await, so it's going to put an object on to the message pump as well. Then, who, th who thinks they know what's going to happen next? Okay, so one of two things, either we're going to go here, or we're not, and the case is actually we're not. We return from there back to our callie, caller, sorry, which is, in that case, was the message pump itself. So that's where the execution is now. Next time it runs, <coughs> it's going to notice 
hey, this uh, call we're waiting for on this download async, that is ready, that's complete and ready to, to be put back, resumed back where it was. So it's going to take that off the queue and there's going to be this magical resume that puts us back right back where we were <clears throat> as though we just kind of blocked there the whole time. <clears throat> kind of a quantum leap in our code. Just goes right back to there. Uh, and then this is allowed to finish the rest of the method. Of course there's nothing else left to finish in this method. So where do you think it's going to go? Is it going to go back here? Nope. It's going to go back to the message pump. <clears throat> then the message pump is going to say, hey, <clears throat> we've got another await here that is now completed. So then the execution can move from there, takes it off the queue, can move back to our updated view. Kind of missed with the arrow. Sorry about that. <laughs> and then that method is allowed to continue on. Okay, so not so difficult, right? The thing we just have to understand is it doesn't quite work the way it looks like it works. We're actually kind of pseudo blocking right here while we're awaiting this stuff, that message pump is allowed to continue to do its job. Nothing is executing uh, in the case of IO. Uh, that, that's happening on IO completion port. So, all right. Number one, <clears throat> biggest thing that people are doing wrong is using async void. There's only one and only one reason, uh, sorry, there's only one <clears throat> legitimate reason to use async void, and that is in the top level of an event handler. So let me give you a, a, a real quick example. This is real code. This is actually the code that was kind of broken from an MSDN sample. Now, let's see what's, if we can figure out what's kind of going to go here. As you can see, we've got this send data, which is an async void. <clears throat> we might try and put an await here, but we get a syntax error. We can't put an await there because it's not returning task. So we have to call it kind of like that. And when you call something uh, without the await that's asynchronous, it kind of does a, a fire forget style invocation. <clears throat> so we're going to get this fire forget style invocation happening here. So it's going to go call send data. Then inside of send data, we're going to hit this await. Remember, the await is going to cause our thread to return to its caller. <clears throat> so it's going to go back. And then once we get back, we've got another await, which is going to cause this thread to return to its caller, presumably the framework. And now we've got kind of a race condition going on here because <clears throat> whichever one of these completes first is going to go next. This, we didn't await this send data. So it's happening fire forget style. It's populating a variable that we need over here later. So the program that wrote this probably figured, well, I probably just need to give it some time to let it do its thing. So you see we have this task delay 200, 2000, sorry. And I imagine it probably went like, oh, let's try 500. Well, that works sometimes. I need to work a little bit more. Let's try 1000. Well, that worked a couple more times. Let's try a little higher. 2000, it's working great. The problem is you go and ship this code, and now someone has this even slower internet connection, and it's failing again. So what do you do? You put up to 10 seconds, 100 seconds? How long are you going to make these poor people wait for their data? <coughs> so... <coughs> That's kind of the, the, the problem with the, the fire and forget. So, and, and the biggest, bigger problem than that, it's not just a fire and forget, uh, it's a fire and there's no way you could have ever have remembered. Because we're turning void, we're never getting a, a handle to that task. There's no way to wait for that task. <clears throat> so the caller is completely unable to know when the call is completed. And if there's an exception, in fact, that was another thing that we're, I'm supposed to point out here, sorry. You'll notice I have a try catch here. The problem is, after this 2,000 milliseconds has elapsed, it's going to burn right through that try catch. It's done, it's over. This thing could later be completed, but it's nowhere anywhere near this try catch. <laughs> it doesn't even care about it. It's completely independent code at that point. You can see they obviously meant to capture the error from send data. Maybe they got a 404, maybe they got some other error, but that's not going to happen because of the way they, it's structured. So uh, guidance is only ever use async void for those top level event handlers or something very similar to it. If you find yourself typing that out, think twice, you're probably doing it wrong. OK, 
Okay? All right, next one. <clears throat> uh, async void lambdas. So, uh, sometimes you could be working with a lambda that is returning an action. Sometimes you're going to work with a lambda that's returning a funk of task. These will execute asynchronously, but one will be an async void and the other will be async task. Well, uh, task.run, for example, accepts both a action and a task of funk. So if we give it a statement such as this, which by the way, don't ever actually do this, but for, for sake of scientific research, if we were to pass in task.run and we pass this expression, and we can see that based on however we're capturing it, it could be either a, an action or a funk. Um, how do you think the runtime is going to handle this? Fortunately, C Sharp will always pick task funk over action, so we're safe there. But the guidance is still clear uh, oops, that uh, anytime we have a lambda, we should double check to make sure that it's not casting it someplace as an action rather than a funk of task. So, fire beware. Okay, race conditions. So, a race condition is just kind of a general thing where uh, we are dependent on something and we're not actually making double sure that something else to give us the something actually completed. Say we have a resource. Say it's like a, a bitmap. If we load this bitmap asynchronously and then we want to use it sometime later, if we don't know for sure that that asynchronous load of the bitmap has completed before we, you know, try and assign it to uh, a, re a, a picture or to read its dimensions or something like that, then we're falling into this pattern. And this is always, always, always going to be a bad idea. It, this is definitely one of those, it works on my machine, broken out in the wild, <coughs> hair pulling, frustrating type things. If you're writing this kind of code, stop. <laughs> Think what you're doing, figure out a better way. Uh, you probably have something wrong with the design approach you're taking. Okay, next one. Uh, Async and constructor. Well, the problem is constructors can't be called as async. Therefore, if you need to do something in the constructor that's async, you're not going to be able to await it. So, uh, the general guidance here is don't run that in the constructor. I remember constructors for uh, kind of class setup type activities, and something that's async probably doesn't follow under follow under the class setup uh, definition. Um, there's also async factory methods we can use. Um, but no matter what, do not call an async method in the constructor as fire and forget. You're creating a race condition. Uh, another similar one is to that is uh, properties getters and setters. If you're running async code in a getter or setter, uh, stop, think what you're doing. <laughs> the easiest thing to do would probably take that property and convert it into a method instead. Um, but Beyond, if, if that's not an option, then some other things I can think of are uh, maybe wait for an event to be called. Remember, all events can be invoked asynchronously. Uh, but no matter what you're doing, don't just call it uh, without the await as a fire and forget. That is not a good thing to do. All right. <clears throat> People often say, ask. This is probably one of the number one things asked in Stack Overflow about async await. How do I run it synchronously? The problem is you kind of have a flaw in your design right then, right? The .NET framework ever since uh, 4.0 and the task parallel library has been kind of reworked to work well with async and await. And all the frameworks, whether it be ASP.NET or WinForms, WPF, they're native, uh, they natively talk async and await. So if you find yourself uh, in a position where like, I need to run this synchronously for some reason, you're probably doing it wrong. <laughs> now, you can run them synchronously. Now, this first option doesn't work. Uh, you can't call dot run synchronously because uh, it loses its context. It doesn't work. You'll get the invalid operation exception. Uh, it says it's unbound to a delegate. Okay, now on the second 
example here, load async is an async void, and we're calling that wait on it. Now, the thing is, uh, the dot wait is only going to wait long enough for the async to have happened, but not wait long enough for it to have been completed. The reason is it's an async void, so there's nothing to wait for other than the actual call of it. So uh, that can be problematic, but it can sometimes work as well. Uh, and then the last one is dot .result, which uses futures. Is that the right word? <laughs> and it's going to block your thread for the result. Well, the problem with number two and number three is that you're both blocking the UI thread. You're going to have a bad user experience. You shouldn't do that either. Uh, and the last one does still technically work, but again, you're still blocking that thread for something else to happen. You shouldn't really do it that way either. Again, the best thing to do is to figure out why it is you're in a, something that's not synchronous, where you need to call something synchronous and make the square pegs and round holes match up. <coughs> okay, so that's pretty much what I've said. All right, uh, this one <coughs> is kind of a misunderstanding of uh, the purpose of async and await. So CPO bound work versus IO bound work. Now, uh, async await is purely for I.O. bound work. What it's trying to do is, while we're waiting, we're going to allow the other things to happen, other stuff to, to function. If our task is not actually waiting, but it's doing some really heavy lifting, then uh, all we've really done is queue on the thread pool, and there's better ways to do it than through async and await, uh, and it's going to work more correctly anyway. So you'd use mechanisms like uh, parallel.4 uh, or for each, that kind of thing. Um, I don't think I actually got anything here. Uh, and also if you if you do uh, the thread pool, so when you do uh, wait, it, it puts on the thread pool. <coughs> the thread pool uh, may have, a, if you, sorry, <laughs> Let me back this up. Can you edit this when we're done? <laughs> <clears throat> if you do have I.O. bound work and you do put on a thread pool without async and wait, say you're just going to just queue it, it causes another set of problems. The set of problems that that causes is we've, we've got this uh, thread now running and all it's doing is waiting for something else. That's what I.O. bound is, right? Well, if that thread is blocked waiting and the TPL notices, hey, I've got a bunch more work to have happen. I'm going to need to spawn more threads. It uses a hill climbing algorithm to decide how many more threads, but it's really kind of a slow increment of that thread. So you don't want to explode with new threads, right? Uh, so it can increase your performance a little bit, but uh, again, those thread pool objects aren't designed to hold I.O. bound stuff. They're more designed for CPU bound stuff. So <clears throat> what you're really doing is uh, you're frustrating the framework's ability to, to do it properly when you're doing it this way. Because if it's IO bound, there's probably an async and wait for it. And if you're just calling it you know, synchronously in a thread, then it's, it's going to uh, encounter some challenges. So yes, anyway. Cool. Uh, and this one's just a pretty basic one. If you're going to make a method that is asynchronous, take the time to not only just add async to the signature, but also add async to the name. It's very confusing when uh, we have calls that don't show async. Also, if, uh, if it doesn't have async behind it and we kind of see the call in a method without the wait, uh, we, we don't pick up on it as quickly as we might if it did say async. We'd have to actually go back and look for the build warnings for, for that. So. Uh, next one is kind of the opposite of that. Don't use async if you don't need it. E.g., if you have a method that's not awaiting anything, uh, take the time to drop async off of it. Um, you'll actually get a compiler warning, CS 1998. <coughs> uh, you should pay attention to those warnings. Okay, next one is uh, another common question, async reentrancy. So what this is all about is uh, imagine you have a win form and there's a button on there that says, you know, uh, get shipping costs. And someone's just pounding on that button. 
and making like 30 requests to the shipping to get the result. And let's say it can really mess things up in your application. Um, there's a lot of ways to, to get around this. The easiest probably way is probably to disable that button while the async call is happening. So just put a button enabled equals false, await call, button enabled equals true, you're done. That's pretty the pretty easiest way. Um, there's another couple ways. One is um, essentially if the method is already in progress and you hit them in the async method again, you can just return right away. Uh, you can use a gate locking, like a mutex or semaphore or a, a monitor lock of some sort to serialize access to the call. Or you can cancel the previous async call and issue a new one. So that's it for mine. Any questions async await? Yeah. You said you'll get a warning CS 1998, I think. Yeah. If you, is that to tell you to drop the async because it's already going to be? That's because you have the async, but you have no await inside of it. There's also a, a, a matching one. It's even probably more important than I thought I had in my slides, but I didn't see it in here. It's, uh, it's the warning for uh, calling an async method synchronously without awaiting it. And that's an even more big problem. Again, that means you're creating a race condition somewhere, somehow. So, anyway. <laughs>